Psalm 119.
if you're easily offended, I'm sorry. Amen. That's, that's sort of how some people, that's, that's not an apology. That's not a scriptural apology. But I want you to notice, and we, we, we're not going to cover all of this passage. Actually, I'm going to focus on the first uh, three verses, beginning in verse 25. But notice, let's just back up a little bit, and notice, if you will, verse 22. Notice the context of this, and context is everything. Verse 22 says, Remove from me reproach and contempt. Okay, there's reproach. We live in a culture, they lived in a culture, we live in a culture where being, being a Christian is a disadvantage in the world. Are you aware of that? Being a Christian is a disadvantage. Matter of fact, they seem to be afraid of us. They call us Christian nationalists. As if we could install Bible-believing, blood-bought believers in every state, federal, and local institution. We cannot do that. Uh, I don't think that's God's will, but they are so afraid of us because they're afraid of Christ. And I do believe, this is just an aside, I do believe one reason that people hate Israel is because they hate the Bible. They hate Israel, they hate Christ, they hate the genealogical bloodline of Christ, which, is, which happens to be Jewish, right? Now that the Bible, for the most part, is a Jewish book. It, it really is. As a matter of fact, Abraham is our father spiritually, is he not? We, we see that in the very definitely in the book of Galatians. So we see the slander going on here in verse, in verse 22. Notice verse 23 of Psalm 119. Princes also did sit and speak against me. And then let's jump right down to my text. Notice the beginning of 25 and 28. Notice what 25 says. My soul cleaveth unto the lot. Dust. That can affect the body. This is this is could, could be some commentators say kind of a near death experience. So the inner man is cleaving to the dust. And notice, if you will, verse twenty-eight. My soul again. My soul melteth. That's the idea of of dropping water. That's the idea of weeping. My soul is weeping. Again, this is metaphorical, not what souls don't weep, by the way. By the way, the word soul can be translated life. So the inner man is, is weeping, and maybe the outer man, maybe we're crying, and melted for what? Heaviness, heaviness there is grief. So I want to preach, and I actually I think I've changed it. Actually, revival of the soul, but really, I want to preach for, for helping Help me help for hurting hearts. This passage gives to us, and again, we're just covering three verses. We've got an outline of the whole passage, but we're not going to come back next week and, and pick up. I just want to focus on these three verses. What we have in our passage is help for hurting hearts. Let's jump right in. I trust you, I trust you did pick up a, 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 an outline. Notice we have a prayer. He talks about his soul. And what is, it, what is he in need of? What is he in need of there in verse 20? My soul, cleave them to the dust, quicken thou me. That's the prayer. What's another word for quicken? That's, that's another word is to revive. Revive. And folks, that's something we all need. We think of revival. Actually, revival is, and I'm not being picky, but revival is not a Bible term. You know, you go by a church and they have a big marquee and it says revival meetings, August whatever through August whatever. You, you, can't, you can't make up revival. You can't, you can't produce that. I mean, there are there been some wonderful revivals. Believe me, think of Scotland or Ireland or even in our own country. There have been you know, the first great awakening, the second great awakening in the 1850s in New York City was a prayer meeting revival. And that's where a lot of people get right. You know, the bars are empty and the prayer meetings are full. Amen? That's a, a reviving. The word reviving, matter of fact, this, this passage, this word occurs over and over in this Psalm 119. We see in verse 25, verse 37, Quicken thou me in thy way, verse 40. Quicken me in thy righteousness, verse 88. 
Quicken me after thy loving kindness, verse 107. Quicken me, O Lord, verse 148. Quicken me according to thy judgments, 154. Quicken me according to thy word, um, 156. Quicken me according to thy judgments. And I could go on. So that's the focus. We think of this passage as dealing with the Bible, and it is. But there's a quickening, there's a reviving, and he is depressed. He is crying physically and spiritually. He is in a very low spot. So we have this, we have this prayer, quicken me according to thy what? What quickens us? You know, some people get quickened quicken because they uh, they take drugs or they go to the bottom or they entertain themselves to death. That, that does not quicken the inner. So there is a, and by the way, it's interesting, now he's praying to God but the word quicken in the original, that's actually an imperative. Now by the way, we can't go around commanding God, but that's actually the verb is an imperative, and he's he's begging, he's beseeching, he's pleading, and I'm going to just move right in to our second actually beating the outline verses 26 and 27. Notice what it says: I have declared my way. Now the word way can refer to a path or, or a road or a journey, and you can. The thought here is that Lord. I'm sharing my troubles, my burdens, my depression, my, my, my grief, my, my sadness, my, my fears. You're taking all those things and you're taking them to God. See what it says. I declare my ways. Notice, notice, notice what happens. I'm declaring, I'm praying. I'm laying out my problems. Verse 20. I declare my ways. And what did God do? What does it say? I know you. Okay. I keep forgetting that stuff. I keep thinking you're looking at the wrinkles on my forehead. <laughs> Actually, I keep thinking you ought to look at your Bibles. So what's the answer? Does God hear? Does it say it right there? You see it? You see it? Does He hear? Yes. I don't doubt it. When you know in the light, when you know when skies are fair, and then the darkness comes, and the rain comes, and the tragedy comes, and the difficulty comes, and there's fears without, right? Fears without, fears within, pressure without, pressure within. What do you do? What do you do? Remember verse 28, my soul melteth, right? He's crying. He's grieving, my soul cleaveth unto the dust, near death. Verse 26, I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. But let's keep going in verse 26. Teach me thy what? Statues. I'm going to go right into verse 27. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. Because we don't always understand. Do you always understand what God is doing? Can you always figure it out? Let me see in verse 27. So shall I talk of thy wonders. So the word talk has a connotation of meditation. So I want to spend a little, I'm going to spend a lot of time on meditation. This is my point. This down from an expository sermon, and I'm going, to, I'm going to develop a topic. I want to focus on the idea of meditation, and I'm going to start. Let's go back, and this is not fair, it's not your own. I'm going to go back to verse 15. Can you go back to verse 15? It says, Psalm 119, verse 15 says this, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. You see that? Meditation. I want you to see it again in verse 23. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but by so what are we supposed to do, folks? What is the psalmist doing in this text? Can you tell me? He's meditating. But thy servant did meditate 
in thy statutes. And I'm going to go to a different text. Uh, if you don't mind, we're going to do a little Bible study. Let's turn over to Psalm chapter 1. There's different words in the original language for the word meditate. They're all closely related. The differences are, are very small and slight. So this is a little different word, but it's, it's, it's virtually uh, a synonym. But I want to read a few verses in Psalm chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, God, ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So what does he delight in? This may be negative to some of you, but he's a separatist. He's a separatist. Right? There's certain people he doesn't run with. You see that in verse 1? There's certain people he doesn't walk with, there's certain people he doesn't stand with, and there's certain people he doesn't sit with. He may try to win them. He can have contact, right? He can have contact. He can be a witness. He can evangelize, but he's but he's careful. Ever since uh, I've been, I've been trying to get close to the Amish. We, for those visitors, we have 29 Amish families in, in our general, some of them all in Washington, Windsor, we have 29 Amish families. And we had an Amish conference a number of months ago. And I've been really trying, I'm, I'm, I've been meeting and greeting. I just go, I just drive in and get out and I think of something to say. Okay, and I just talk to them and uh, I, um, I went on the, the, the closest farm, and I hadn't been there, hadn't been there for a day or two. And uh, I went on, and Jonathan came up to me, and they, he needed, they needed to get 26 boxes of peaches. And I said, sure, I'll go get, I'll go get them. So I drove over someplace uh, to another Amish farm in Whitefield. And they, they packed in these, you know, these big boxes, 20, and I kept, I kept talking to the Amish guy and I kept saying, uh, is, is that too heavy? Because, you know, the back was going down and the, top, <laughs> the tires are going flatter. And then I, I kind of teased him, you know, the Amish don't have a great sense of humor, okay? <laughs> Maybe it's a Pennsylvania Dutch. No offense if we have any Pennsylvania Dutch people here. And I said, I think I know more about cars than you do. And he just kind of looked at me and I think he, he said, I think all right, we, we voted some other things, and so I took it back, and, and when I, I always give him a business card, and I said, I tell you what, if you need my phone, you know, you can use my phone, and I will give you a ride for free. When they offer me money, I, I, I don't want money, because I want to be their friend. Now, I'm not going to take them to Boston, okay, but I'll, I'll take them to Rockland. I'll take them to Augusta, maybe, you know, shopping, or maybe a dental appointment, or whatever. But my, my goal, my goal is evangelism. I don't want to offend anybody, but if you think you have to have, if you think you have to have a horse and buggy to get to heaven, you're wrong. I just I just want you to know that. And I want you to know that we don't have to bless our life. Aren't you glad? I don't think I could give away any bow ties to the guys around. I don't you know, they're not mad enough, I guess, to wear one anyway. But uh, I, I, I just want to share that with you. Aren't you glad that we that every you know every star shines in glory? Because that legalistic system doesn't lead to grace and it doesn't lead to heaven. So I want to share with them. But I tell you one thing, you've got to spend a lot of time just being friends and just and just loving. So I'm not talking about isolation. I'm talking about loving people to Christ but not living their life, whatever that life is, and whatever group they're with. So we want to focus on this, this idea of, of meditation, but when, when we talk about meditation, then some of you may have some false concepts. I read a book, I brought the cover, uh, but I read a book years ago, it's called God's Battle Plan for the Mind, uh, The Puritan Practice of Biblical Meditation. It's by David M. Saxton, who's a the pastor in Cambridge, Ohio. So I bought this book a number of years ago and I was reading it and uh, I was really enjoying it. I, I probably need to read it again. And as I was reading this book, 
I, I talked to a pastor on the phone. I said, I'm reading this really, really good book on meditation. He said, I don't believe in that. He said, that's transcendental meditation. <laughs> and I thought, so Bible meditation is not the same thing as transcendental, transcendental meditation. This is not relax, relaxation therapy, and some of us ought to relax, amen? Some of you are the kind of people when you relax, you get nervous, so I'm not against relaxing. Uh, this is not New Age movement. This is not Far Eastern religion. This is not transcendental meditation. This is meditating on the book. That's, I just want to clear out the trees, and I'm not talking about any of those things. If people, people want to do that, I don't care. But as believers, we're going to meditate on the Bible. I want to spend just a few minutes with that because that's, it is, it's actually very, very, very important that, that we understand meditation. So it says, and again, I, I hope you're inside, I'm kind of jumping around here, but it says in verse 2, but his delight is in the what? His delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law. And what does he do? He meditates how often? Sunday morning from 9.30 to 10.30 before snack time. Is that right? Now the word in the original language, meditate, literally means to, to, to moan. Think of the cooing of a dove, or like a big lion that's charred, that charring, chewing on a bone. It has the idea of to utter, mutter, muse. It has the, even the idea of talking. Do you do that when you memorize? Memorize? See, we believe in reading the Bible, right? You do, you do read your Bible? You better be reading your Bibles. If you're not reading your Bibles, I want to irritate you to read your Bibles. I want to, I want to provoke you. Now, in a positive, right? Provoke you unto love. To love. I have a, I just finished reading the Bible through. I would recommend. You can see I'm not lying. This has actually been used, all right? This has been taped and taped and taped. I just finished a few weeks ago and it's starting again. This is a McSh McShane. Scotsman. Daily, uh, daily Bible for daily bread. He was a Scottish minister. Died in the, he was a Church of Scotland minister. He died in 1843. And I quote, we must be, just, just before he died, we must be driven more to our Bibles and to the mercy seat. We have Bible reading. We have prayer. But what's in between? we got to meditate. It's not enough, listen, it's not enough to drag your eyes over the text. We've all, I've, I've done that, right? I've done that. You're just reading. I've got four more chapters to keep up with my schedule. Sometimes ahead, sometimes I'm on, sometimes I'm behind. And we've got to be careful. We're not just dragging our eyes over the pages. But he talks about it. And if you listen, if you read, if you read four chapters a day, now, for those mothers with young children, I know this is a hill too much, okay? Because you're busy, busy, busy. I, I understand that. But listen to me, folks. Four chapters a day, you can read the entire Old Testament once and the Psalms and the New Testament twice. So let's, let's, let's do, uh, how about two chapters a day? How's that? Am I being gracious? In two chapters a day, uh, you can finish the signs of the New Testament every year and the Old Testament every other year. So my point is, you can't meditate if you're reading it. You say, well, I have a devotional book. And I'm not against devotional books. I know the Moody does and uh, there's others that we pass out and that's great. But that doesn't get you the Bible. And what we read is, we don't just need signs and problems every day. All right? So I think some of us may need some wisdom every day and some sweetness every day. We got our sweetness from Psalms and we got our wisdom from Psalms. But I would encourage you. I really want to do that. I know it's not in the text, but you can't meditate on something you don't know. So I just want to encourage us. In all the busyness of life, I want to encourage us uh, to read. But also, 
to meditate. By the way, I have to say this, that the Protestant Reformation, one of their, remember those statements, Sola, Chris, Sola Christus, uh, Sola Deo Gloria, and one of them is Sola Scriptura. Only the Bible. We keep going to the Bible. We keep, we keep pointing to verses. So I want to stress, and I want to turn to another verse. We're going to take a little time. Don't worry about your outline. You may never come back to it. But Psalm 119, I want to stress verse 97. Verse 97. <coughs> Notice what it says. Just look as I read. Psalm 119, verse 27. Oh, how I love thy law! Exclamation! He's excited. See, it real, listen, it really is real. We love the Bible. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my what? What is it? It's when I'm Can I go to middle? If I had my way, aren't you glad I don't have my way? If I had my way, I don't know if I should tell you. If I had my way, I would go back to communication like my wife and I had when we were dating. And young people, that was in the last century. Deep into the last century. She lived for, for the year before we got married. She lived in Ohio and I lived in Bucksport. And my mother had a black telephone that hung on the wall. And I called her 12 times in a year. Because I couldn't afford more than 12 times. And that string, it was in the hallway, okay? In the middle of the hallway. <coughs> Kitchen in one direction, living room in the other. And I'd string the cord across. You can't, you can't say sweet nothings with your brothers walking by giving you a hard time. So I'd string the cord across into the bedroom and shut the door. You know, like this. And my brothers would go by and they'd take the cord. <laughs> and we would talk. Now, and I was never, by the way, I was never addicted to that black phone. <coughs> you know what I'm doing? I'm reading important things that don't matter. The phone, listen, the phone has become a source of entertainment. The phone has become a source of distraction. The phone affects relationships. On the phone, we see things we shouldn't. We focus on the phone and not on people. People are killed because they're playing on their phone and they're not driving. Maybe we should focus on the Bible. And we're not an amen church, but if you just want to go ahead. Amen. Amen. I think it would be great. Let's remember, it's... Remember, you know, Chuck Swindoll, he, he called television the plug-in drug. The phone is worse. It's a bitch. I don't need to always know what's going on. I need to know what God says. That's what I really need to know. I'll never make it through life as a godly, happy Christian and all the problems and all the difficulties and all the tragedies and all the trials and all the discouragements unless I'm focused on the person that worked with Christ and Christ spoke in the volume of the book it is written of me. It's written of Christ. Well, let's go to the book and look and seek for Christ. Let's preach Christ. Let's love Christ. Let's read His book because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable. My phone is not like that. The Bible's profitable. Bodily exercise is great now, but it won't help you in heaven. But spiritual exercise helps here and helps there, amen? amen. Notice verse 97 again. Oh, how I love thou, Lord, is my meditation all the day. Very quickly, I'm going to, I'm going to share a couple of points from, from uh, Brother Saxton. You can look him up by his book. 
Meditation heals a believer's heart and settles his mind. Isn't that good? And that's a quote. Meditation heals a believer's heart and settles his mind. Don't look to anything else. And lastly, he says, meditation is necessary for an ever-growing, healthy believer. I'll quote that again. Meditation is necessary for an ever-growing, healthy believer. I want to turn to one more text, and then we'll be done, okay? Let's all turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Do you need help? Get it from the Lord. Do you need help? Read the Bible. Do you need help? What's the next step? Meditate on what you're reading. Do you need help? And what is meditation? Meditation is thought for application. I'm reading it, I'm thinking about it, and I'm attempting to apply it to my life. I'm taking the Bible, which is many times abstract, it's to, it's to nations, it's to generations around the world, it's for all time and all people, and I'm reading it, and I'm thinking about it, and I'm praying over it, and I'm applying it to me. It applies to me, it is for me. This is not speculative, this is not contemplative, this is practical. Meditation is the practical application of the Bible to my personal life. I'm taking that verse and I'm, I'm applying it to Tony. I'm going to write that verse on a 3 by 5 card and stick it in my pocket. I'm going to memorize that verse so when that temptation, temptation comes, and we are all tempted, right? One man said we have designer lusts. Satan designs temptations for you because he knows your weaknesses, he knows your struggles, he knows your problems. So I need, when I'm struggling with that problem, I need a verse. Matter of fact, when I counsel, I'm not a professional counsel. I just sit there with a legal pad and my Bible and a pen. I take notes and take notes and take notes. And then when I'm done, I say, well, the Bible says I'm going to give you five verses to read morning and evening. Twice per diem, you don't need to pay for food, you won't hurt your stomach, okay? Twice a day, I want you to read these verses for the next six weeks. I want you to memorize them. So when that temptation comes, the Bible is in your mind. You don't have to look it up, right? It's right in your heart. It is in your mind. And I want to stress this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. I'm sorry, verse, uh, I want, I'm sorry, verse 8. Finally, brethren, don't you like a preacher who says finally and keeps going? So he's got to go on for a while. But notice, if you will, verse 8 of Philippians 4. Finally, brother, what sort of things are true? Where is truth found in the God's Word? What sort of things are honest? Where is, where is honesty, integrity found in the Bible? What sort of things are just? Justice and righteousness are found in the Word of God. What sort of things are pure? Purity is found, you know, God's wisdom from above is first what, according to James? It is first pure. What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? If there be any virtue, and there is, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, and there is, what are you thinking about? What are you musing about? Listen, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? We ought to be talking about the book. Now, we ought to share discouragements as prayer requests, but sometimes we just, we just complain when we're not sharing prayer requests. We shouldn't be bragging. It's not about us. It's about Christ. But when we share, there ought to be prayer requests or praises. There ought to be verses that God... Listen, we ought to be in the book so much that every day you could share with another believer how God has spoken to you from His book that day. You can't do it one hour Sunday morning. It won't do. You'll fail. <coughs> if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, what are we supposed to do? Think. How do you have a revived soul? To get a revived soul, you need the Bible, read it, meditate, and pray. 
right? Read it, meditate, and pray. And whatever happens, you will be sustained. Amen? Go above.